your relationship with money matters. I'm Michelle Perkins, and this is the Money and You podcast, where I will be breaking down your relationship with money, offering tough love money tips, and a money dating plan that will focus on lifting the barriers to success to help pave the way for better money practices and increased wealth. It's time to take control to live a limit-free life. It starts today. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Money and You show. I'm so happy that you're here, and I'm extraordinarily happy that my guest is here because she's fabulous. And so we're going to have a great show today. I'm just off of a four-day conference, um, a lot of business scaling techniques and methods and talk about how to bring spirituality and, and creativity and things into the workplace so that you can grow and scale your business and, and as well as living a happy, fulfilled life. And uh, one of the things that came up, which I just loved because I thought it was such a great entree into the um, conversation we're going to have today, was the idea of when you are worried in your business, when things aren't going necessarily, or in your career, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a business owner for this, but anytime you're in sort of that energy of worry, one of the suggestions that was made was to uh, shift your worry energy into creative energy. And I thought that was pretty brilliant. So I'm going to try from now on, whenever there's something that's worrying me to ask myself, how can I turn this energy into some kind of creative energy and come up with something new out of the box and, and think differently about everything. So with that, I want to introduce my fabulous guest today. Her name is Maria Brito, and she is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, author, and curator. A Harvard graduate originally from Venezuela, her first monograph out there was published by Pointed Leaf Press in 2013 and was the recipient of the best book awards in both art and design categories. In 2015, Ms. Brito was selected by Complex Magazine as one of the 20 power players in the art world. And in 2020, she was named by Art News as one of the visionaries who gets to shape the art world. She's written for publications such as Entrepreneur, Huffington Post, Elle, Forbes, Artnet, Cultured Magazine, Departures, and the Gulf Coast Journal of Literature and Fine Arts from the University of Houston, Texas. For several years, Maria has taught her creativity course in companies, and in 2019, she launched Jumpstart, an online program on creativity for entrepreneurs based on years of research and observation in both the areas of business and art. She's worked on numerous product collaborations with artists such as Kenny Scharf, Eric Parker, Catherine Bernhardt, Assume Vivid Astrofocus, Nir Hod, and many more. There are so many projects that she's worked on. Um, you can read about those on her website as well. There are many, many more. In 2019, she hosted The Sea Files with Maria Brito, a TV and streaming series for PBS's new station, All Arts. The same year, she also curated two exhibitions, Thousand and One Nights, and it, which was the inaugural show of Archville Gallery in Beirut, Lebanon, with seven American artists, and Shona McAndrews' first New York City exhibition at Chart Gallery in Tribeca. Maria and her projects have been featured extensively in national and international publications that are too numerous to mention, but I'll start with the New York Times style section, New York Times Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The Huffington Post, W Magazine, L Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, and I could go on and on. So Maria, welcome. I'm so honored that you're here. Thank you, Michelle. That introduction is so beautiful, but it's so long, you know, <laughs> you're, it's, um, you know, it's it's interesting because sometimes you want to have your bio up to date, but you've done so many things and you you feel like these accomplishments are part of like your life and you don't want to let them go. And I always remember when I was very young and I was putting together my resume, somebody told me, you know, um, the best resumes are really just one page and they don't really have to even go all the way down, you know, and so <laughs> this this long, long things are I mean, a part of who I am, but at the same time, I just feel that at some point I should just shorten the whole thing and work so hard that I don't need to introduce myself anymore. That's kind of, uh, (laughs) that's going to have to be like the goal, you know, I don't have to introduce myself anymore, but thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to join you and your fun audience. And I'm excited to dive in. Yes, thank you. And I I loved your biography and I think you should 
actually write a full biography <laughs> because there's so much there. I didn't even really touch on it. But, um, and we're going to tell people how to uh, find you and learn more about you because there's so many avenues for that as well. But um, yeah, let's dive in with how you got to this place, because, you know, I, this is one thing that I think is really interesting. People's biographies, when they get to a point where they've accomplished a lot and done a lot, they sound amazing, which they are. And yet you don't hear the, the journey that got anybody there. And so people, you know, think it was magic or something, but can you, can you give us a little insight into what you were doing before you were doing this and then how this sure. all came to be? Sure, of course. I um, was born and raised in Venezuela, and I always had this desire to leave my country and uh, move out to the States because I didn't see opportunities of growth. And it's, um, I, you know, I had the vision of leaving before it collapsed. And uh, my ticket to get out was to come here to go to law school. And um, I, I got accepted into Harvard Law School, which was a huge, immense accomplishment, particularly coming from a foreigner who had not studied the whole four you know, years of college here. And I, I had just been working very, very hard on figuring out ways of actually leaving my country. And the, uh, the, the impetus for going to law school was because I grew up in a very strict Catholic family, and it was one of those places where you could only be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or something that was really dependable and old school, if you will. And so I convinced myself that I had to follow that path of dependable jobs because this is what my parents had in mind. And I now understand that they could have never even imagined anything else because in in the third world countries like that nothing else is like available for people with a stream of you know creativity I mean the whole sole idea of what I do right now is like unthinkable you know to them still I, I don't think they understand very well what I do but but the point is that I I worked very hard I graduated I moved to New York, I passed the bar exam, and I practiced as a corporate attorney for nine years, and I hated it, and I was very miserable because it was not my thing. It was something that I was going with emotions. It paid really well, and I, I felt it gave my life some sort of stability, and, uh, and, and also I I felt guilty that I had been through all the law school thing and paid the money and then I was just going to do what, right? But I had my first child and when I realized the enormous responsibility to actually raise a child and to be an example and how also separated we were going to be because law firms are typically jobs where people put in 16 hours a day, work weekends, nights, overnights, you know, that's like a big um, point of honor and law firms just to spend all nighters and things like that. And I did not want anything to do with that lifestyle at all. I was really making a lot of money. I was, I had a lot of benefits and perks and I just did not want anything to do with it. So when I, I went back after the maternity leave, the 12 weeks, and I evaluated everything and I said, I just cannot do this. It's just not something that satisfies me. Uh, I don't want my, my son to follow the steps of what I did, which was selling out on, on having really a fulfilling and fun career. And I'm not saying lawyers don't. I'm saying this was not for me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I quit. And so I... I told my husband that I was going to open a business uh, where I was going to advise uh, advise people in the arts. And look, he thought I was really in the midst of post postpartum depression. <laughs> and like, but he was very supportive in the sense that, you know, well, if this is what you want to do, who am I to stop you, right? I mean, it is just crazy because you don't have clients, you don't have any background in that industry. And, you know, but if you have a dream and you're passionate about it, 
and you have I had already already sort of made my calculations and what I really needed, and it was very minimal the investment because I didn't need to invest in capital or I mean like to have you know like machinery or uh, you know like if I wanted to go in into a fashion business, you have to spend so much money from the get go. It's insane. I mean, my overhead was low, remains low, and it was just like I needed to invest in some sort of communications a partner and PR and messaging and a website and photography. And yeah, those are things that cost money, but it's not the same as having to buy an entire building or rent an entire building, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So I embarked on uh, this dream, like in a way that was quite a risk for me 13 years ago. And it's just been the best thing that I did for myself because it's a seven figure business today. And it's, it's really has allowed me to do everything that I always wanted to do and so many different capacities and varieties and to expand my range, to connect with people all over the world, to travel all over the world, to serve incredibly special clients and I you know I, I, I when I look back I still sometimes have like I recoil in horror of my days <laughs> when I was um, working down in Wall Street with the with the law firm and again they are not bad people it's just I it's it's very difficult even for me to look back and say that was me if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I love everything you're saying. And uh, yeah, I've been reading a lot about how people get to a point where they, and sometimes it's midlife. I think right now, a lot of millennials are experiencing this and uh, where all of a sudden there's this sort of depression or something hits you where you're just not being your yourself. You know, you've put yourself in something that looks really good on paper, but it doesn't feel right inside. And for a long time, you can kind of, work it anyway. And then there comes a point where, you know, maybe not for everybody, but for a lot of people where all of a sudden they hit this wall and they don't really understand it, but it, it does come down to what you're saying, where people are just, you know, they're doing something that is just not in alignment with who they are, what they care about, what their interests are. And, you know, the money and everything doesn't quite make up for that as much as we'd like it to maybe. <laughs> Yes, and I am pretty sure you've also read that since the pandemic hit us, it's it's what is the economists are denominating the uh, years of the great resignation because yeah. people are leaving their jobs in droves because they realized that they just did not want to get consumed by those environments and or they were completely unhappy and they were just sort of like hosting and trying to put a little bit of like, you know, patch here, a little patch there to kind of um, avoid having to confront that reality. And then something as big and impactful as COVID-19 hits us and everybody starts to rethink what they're doing with their lives. Mm -hmm. And the, the beautiful thing about this great resignation is that we are going to see a different America that is a more entrepreneurial, uh, more creative, where, where people have different ways of making money that is not just working for companies that they don't want to be a part of. And that is going to help reactivate many sectors of the economy and also give the US a competitive edge that had been lost for many, many years. And one thing is that it's very important to highlight that being an entrepreneur is a full-time job and it's way more demanding than, than a, you know, when you are at, at a job with the boss and sitting mm -hmm. down at a desk because your name is on the line, it's, on, it's, it's like on you know, the door, you have different types of problems, right? I mean, it's, it's you have money that you have to raise or you have to generate, you have people that you have to pay, you have certain milestones that you have to hit, right? So mm -hmm. it, it's not just like, I'm just gonna open a business. It's, it's, that's 
that's the dream starts there and that's like the effort that the the entrepreneurial effort comes with that spirit of like yes i'm going to open a business and i'm going with it and honestly I always think about this examples of there are entrepreneurs who are huge risk takers and there are others who are very successful and don't necessarily have to go crazy. Like, for example, the guys who opened um, Warby Parker, mm -hmm. they all kept their jobs until the company was kind of running because they were conservative and these guys had met at Stanford and you know, the, uh, or Wharton, actually, it was Wharton. Mm -hmm. And they were brilliant, but they just did not want to. So it's kind of like, I, I love... I'm a risk taker and I, I think that I favor that, but people have to always go with what their gut tells them and how far they can get into whatever it is that they want to do next, right? And so we are in the perfect time for that, those things to happen uh, because the context and our surroundings are primed for that. And so if anybody is thinking about doing that, this is the right time to do it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I, I love your positive take on this whole shift that we're having because I feel the same way. I feel like we've needed to kind of break this model of, of work the way people view it and, and it's happening. I'm, I'm shocked actually. And the statistics I read are that the majority of the people who are, you know, participating in this great resignation are actually millennials who have at least five years of work and are in management positions which they're yeah. kind of in, in the old way of thinking, they're sort of poised to go to that next level. And you know, they're the ones who I think would have stuck around more. Uh, so I find it really to be an interesting statistic that those are the people who are deciding to leave, so. Yeah, well, I mean, also, you know, millennials are not very committed to anything. And I think that's, <laughs> we have to say it out loud because that's the truth. I mean, I'm not, it's, you know, I mean, they don't rent, they don't buy, they just rent, right? Like, I mean, they don't, they don't get married. They just date on Tinder, right? So it's it's like, okay, I get it. And now, I mean, open go open businesses, you guys, mm -hmm. because if you don't want to work for people, I totally understand. I was I was like that, uh, but now we also need you guys to come up with other businesses, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot a lot of most of the newer technology companies are millennial owned. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know not all but a lot and uh, now we now need we have a lot of other problems to solve right including right. the way we're living um, you know future pandemics that may happen you know climate change mm -hmm. we have you know there's so much now in the space of technology that needs to be mined uh, that needs to be the, the whole world of gaming and metaverses and things like that so this space is humongous for anything and if you just want to open a shoe store that's fine too <laughs> I mean what I'm saying is that there's room for everything and everyone if you bring your your gifts and and your talents to your what you're doing in, in your heart and soul and that's very important because business is impersonal but entrepreneurship is very personal and so mm -hmm. every failure is very well felt and i think that you don't know that until you own your business when people say ah don't take that personally no i do take it personally because <laughs> this is my business you know yeah. I take it damn personally. So people have to be very aware of what they are going to get into if, if they are considering opening a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there is, that's a whole conversation in itself. And, and I'm curious, when you went from working as an attorney, um, you had sort of two things to learn. You had to learn business and the entire art world was suddenly, you know, your world. And so did right. you... How did you navigate that? Well, the art world by and in itself, although it was a mystery as to be an insider, it wasn't such because I had been, uh, I started collecting art for myself when I moved to New York in year 2000. And I already understood the mechanics and um, some of the players in the business and had a kind of, I mean, a good idea what I was getting into, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the same when you look at things from the outside than when you actually are in the midst of things with talking to the people that are going to be your partners, your clients, you know, your uh, facilitators, your vendors, your, you know, colleagues, coworkers, things like that, right? So it's a very okay. different thing. And so learning the ropes of the art world, obviously, 
was, you know, it, it was a pleasure in one way, but also it wasn't that difficult. I think that it's, uh, I think that the desire to get things done mm -hmm. was so big for me that I didn't mind if I had to spend the whole night reading, let's say, for example, right? Because it was for me and when it was pleasurable and I found it fascinating and interesting, right? And so I think that it's also when you want, there is always this saying or or like some, sometimes I put together these words that it's very difficult to disrupt the industry that pays your bills. Mm -hmm. Because once you are an insider, you have already created a lot of biases in your mind. You have a lot of preconceptions. You have, you know, and these are just things that have been planted and they might not necessarily be true, but you have been trained to think in a particular way. And that's why those things are part of like your, you know, mental, uh, mapping and also mm -hmm. your brain wiring and i just did not have any of those biases or preconceptions because i had not been a part of the art world before so if anybody told me do not do business with so and so because he is an ogre or you know do not do this with this artist because of this i just didn't care because i was like i have to try this for myself and if the person is an ogre okay well listen i got burned and i didn't listen to what they told me but I went and I tried myself the majority of the times things were not what people said right it's just a, a wives tales it's a you know a combination of myths that have been perpetuated you know and things like that so for me being a complete outsider was very very helpful mm -hmm. in the sense that I I was able to navigate the system with fresh eyes and people welcomed the, that kind of like, part of it was like naivete, if you will. Yeah. And another part of it was like, I just didn't have, I, I wasn't holding grudges. I didn't have any enemies. I, you know, and so that was, that was always to my advantage and learning the business part of things. I mean, I was a corporate attorney, so that wasn't that hard, you yeah. know? I mean, I had already, I mean, uh, day in and day out, we had to, like read balance sheets of humongous businesses you know it was like i worked in a lot of huge venture capital business deals and it was just like general electric divisions and things like that so i was always reading balance sheets i was always working with a lot of documentation that had to do with loans and people issuing bonds and i mean institutions issuing bonds and so nothing was really like oh what am i doing you know mm -hmm. what i mean i think right. that especially since I didn't have to go. I mean, I could have gone and raised a million bucks, but I didn't need to do it because my business did not require that amount of capital to start. Mm -hmm. But I think that, it, you know, I had a really, thank God, right? Like I had a very good foundation that I had all those years of corporate practice. And I had this interesting on the go foundation of art yet it's, you know, it's still, as I'm telling you, I was like improvising everything for years, right? Because I didn't have answers for many things. I didn't know how the mechanics of many things worked. And, um, but I think that the most important thing was to build those relationships early on that I am telling you that are vital for any business. Mm -hmm. and, and to build those relationships, it takes time, but it also takes that level of like friendliness that I had I had no, you know, my mindset was not like I am so important because I was an attorney who went to Harvard and all of you little thingies. That was not what I was thinking, right? I mean, I was, I, it was a very different thing. I mean, in fact, I, I remember that one of the, the feelings that I had the most was this feeling of gratitude to have the opportunity to do something where a lot of people told me I was going to fail because I, I called I called people who were in the field who were friends of friends and, you know, they were like, nah, you know, I like you have no idea. I mean, I, some people make me feel really small, but but it was a temporary thing. I was like, OK, you make me feel small in like, you know, a 20 minute conversation or something. And, you know. I'm not going to let this actually take me away from, from my dreams or from the things that I want to do mm -hmm. because those people don't know anything about me. You know, I'm just asking for a, an opinion uh, 
and uh, they are already kind of ruling me out and I'm not going to let that take my dreams away, you know, and, and this is yeah. also very, it's a very common thing for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that they receive a lot of negative feedback and mm -hmm. um, the naysayers say, you're not going to be able to make this and this is not going to happen. So it's up to us to decide, I think that, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, whether you know, like you think you can do it or nobody can make you feel like small without your consent. Yeah. You know, it's like up to you if you are going to decide that what people say is your reality or you can forge your own life and create for you and design for you what you think is best. And mm -hmm. that's what I did. I chose, you know, to go with with the latter instead of believing people who knew nothing about me. And I don't know where those people are, but I know where I am. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't hear, I don't hear much about them. Uh, to be honest, I don't even know if they are in this field anymore. But that's, uh, it's part of the journey, and I'm grateful for each one of the people who said no and the people who said yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the focus on gratitude because that will really take you a long way, and uh, it's it's so important. And yeah, I, I, everything you're saying is so important for people to hear because people can get pretty quickly turned off when enough people tell them not to do something. And it's usually a big mistake, I think, to listen to most of these, especially the naysayers. Not that they it might is. not have some advice or ideas that you want to think about at least, but, you know, people telling you not to do something, it almost doesn't even make sense when you talk about it objectively like this. Like, how would they know and, and why would they I, even say that i think that the act of entrepreneurship itself the act of being out there in the world advocating for yourself and building something that others want is really filled with you know issues and minefields and things like it's it's complicated right mm -hmm. and uh, as you know many many businesses fail in the first year and the first five but I think that nobody can take away from you the experience of learning how to do things and nobody can out take away from you the desire to build something that you're very passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. I think that there are, I, I know many, many serial entrepreneurs who are very successful and those people get to that level after they have bought and sold 20, 25 businesses, right? I mean, and they don't necessarily are like super in love with like the next big thing that they put their money on, but it's just, they are passionate about the business of things, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless if they are putting the money on like, you know, a winery or if they are putting their mm -hmm. money on like a software company, it's just right. the passion is like the business of things, right? right. But if you are just starting, it's a different story. It's like you really have to love and, and feel very convinced that what you're going to do is going to solve problems, is going to make you happy, is going to make other people happy, is going to provide a whole new level of services or products to the people that you want to serve. And that's actually what was for me the driver was, I know I can do this job much better than what's out there. And I know that I can give people different angles and different services within the business, even if it's just, you know, starting to blog and things like that, which at the mm -hmm. time nobody did. Nobody 13 years ago who was in my business was blogging and interviewing artists and doing it in an earnest way. Nobody. So you know, you don't have to start thinking. That's the other thing. I think a lot of people have this uh, confusions about raising money and, and what kind of business. Not every business is Facebook. There is only one Facebook, right? I mean, there's only one Mark, Zuck Mark Zuckerberg. There is only one Elon Musk. There is only one Steve Jobs. And so, and even those guys, they just did not start with like a billion, right? I mean, it's just, it's a progressive ladder that you have to climb up. There is a lot of money out in the world um, right now. It's true, mm -hmm. especially with the whole crypto craziness. And I think that it's important for people to kind of like, first of all, be grateful. And second, uh, manage the expectations of where are you going to go to start with or what is it that you're going to get to start with mm -hmm. not every business needs a million not every i mean some do in five 
and more, right? But not every business needs a round of angel investors that is, is, you know, like such a huge number. I think that a lot of things and a lot of ideas can be tested in the marketplace because we do have access to so much, especially through technology. And the prices of doing many things have gotten considerably low mm -hmm. because of this enormous amount of resources that we have in our hands. Right. So it's always important to think about, you know, if you can start small, that shouldn't be a deterrent. It shouldn't be something that it's, it's it, sh it should be looked down upon, you know? Right. It right. should be, in, on the contrary, it should be exciting that you start this small and you can make something really impactful mm -hmm. and big, you know? Right. And there's some great examples out there, especially women, because women have a harder time getting investment capital anyway. But there's some amazing stories of women with, you know, enormous businesses like Susie Batiste of Poupourri and she's I think she's oh yes in no investment capital ever and there are some really really interesting stories of, of starting that way um I wanted to I want to get to creativity and business yes. but I also want to just ask because um you know as we talk about the naysayers I I'd like to kind of um, talk about who did support you because we all, you know, this idea too that you can do this all alone is is a bit of a myth, I think, as well. It is. So just who was who was there to support you in this to help you? My husband, my <laughs> husband, even even though he thought I was um, suffering from the sequels of postpartum depression, which I probably was, and it's fine, you know. I mean, there's no there's no shame in that. Uh, my husband was a supporter because. I mean, when he, he said, he didn't even counter, right? I mean, he said, if this is what's going to make you happy, and he was one of the first people who referred me a client, you know, mm -hmm. and things like that. So my husband was very, very supportive. And I encounter a, early on a few people in on my path, you know, who are still collaborators who work at galleries and now they've gotten like to the top level of those galleries and things like that who saw something in me and uh you know uh, my first big break was given to me by Gwyneth Paltrow so I can say that I'm extremely lucky I mean Gwyneth was introduced by a friend and I told her what I was doing and I explained to her the, what my desire was with art and to get it to people's homes in every way and to connect people to contemporary art, to think about it. And, you know, she she called me one day and she said, you know, I want you to write something for Goop. And that was like when Goop was a once a week thing on a, it wasn't monetized. It wasn't the big, you know, huge company that it is today. And that was my big break, you know? So she supported me in a way that I, it was, I, I didn't even expect what was gonna happen to me after that. That's how my first book came to be. That's how people got to know me and notice me for the first time. And if that would have happened today, no, I mean, no big difference would have happened because we're so diluted. I mean, at that time, Instagram didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. And, um, but uh, I think that I owe her a lot and I, and I think that I will always and forever be grateful because she believed in me, even though I was such a rookie and, um, you know, I, I am, uh, my life has been all a miracle, honestly, and, and uh, um, I just couldn't, I mean, people might be listening to this and say, well, you're so privileged. I'm not. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I came here with very really little and uh, I just was in the right place at the right time and I had the right intentions. And I think that mm -hmm. that's very important. I believe in intent and the intentions. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're aligned with those things, things sort of happen, you know, um, it's it sounds woo woo at times. And I know that business and this type of thing sometimes are not welcomed in, but they actually, are because that's how they work and that's that's how you see people who succeed and that's how you see people who fail and it, it's it has a lot to do with the energy and the intention that they're that you put behind each one of your moves yes yes i i so agree with that and i think intentions then they don't teach you any of this at business school about setting intentions or any of that but it's it turns out as you 
learn more that it's it's very important for most of the successful people that I've run across and the thing that struck me when you were talking about the Gwyneth Paltrow uh, story is how clear you were with your why and you know there's the idea that people connect with your why and if they yeah. understand it and connect with it then you know they will be your supporters and, and your cheerleaders and so um, I think you know you were probably very articulate and clear on what your business was about and why you care about it and, and you know, why it, it, you have this passion for it. And I think that goes a long way when you can express that well. It is, but and it, it's also part of being, you know, when you open a company and you want to see it succeed, you become an idealist, right? Because you start bringing to the table all these objectives and dreams and, 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 you know, you work, through them and with them mm -hmm. to make sure that you understand what happens uh, when you put those ideas out in the world and you try to differentiate because that's part of being creative is to be able to differentiate yourself from your competitors, what already exists, building up new ways and, you know, kind of like blazing your own trail, right? And that's, that's kind of the point of being an innovator and an entrepreneur and a, and a, and a creative, right? And so, those ideas, the way that I expressed them to Gwyneth, she had never heard them before. And that's why, you know, it's not that she's not been in a gallery. It's not that she hasn't been in an auction house. It's not that she knows millions and millions. It's one of the most well-connected people in the world. It is the way that I said them, she was very intrigued, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that um, it obviously, businesses change and mutate and your ideas get different as you go along because you also have to be mindful that you have to serve your audience and your market and meet them where they are not not back in you know 2009 when I opened the business is you know 2021 so you meet people and audiences and things where they are but I think that the why it's super important and it has to be super important to you. And it, it don't be ever afraid of, of clarifying, changing it, pivoting it, mm -hmm. rotating it, or, you know, or deconstructing and building a whole new why, because you have to be comfortable with telling people what is it that you do and why. And so mm -hmm. it's a, it's a work in progress always. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's so inspiring, really. I think uh, if, if people have been thinking about starting in business, I think you're probably getting them to think about it a little <laughs> bit more powerfully. Um, I, gosh, the time is flying by here. I really wanted you to uh, give us a little insight into how people can use creativity more in business. Um, yes. You know, creativity for me is the foundation of every business because if you are not creating, so just to define what I understand by creativity is your unique ability to come up with ideas of value to serve an audience or a market. And the everything really has been done. And what you want to do is to bring your own spin and to try to solve a problem that has meaning to you and, and to make sense of that problem in a way that nobody else has done before. And uh, that's why I am such a, a proponent of this concept of creativity in business for everybody and not just for a few people and not just it's not just for artists and it's not just for tech people it's for everybody and so one um, of the things I tell my students and I also wrote in my book that's coming up in March with Harper Collins is we live in the era of the weapons of mass distraction basically which are you know like the phone the internet the social media listening to the podcast at the same time that you're crossing the street at the same time that you're sending a text right and what that has done for all of us is to numb all our senses to the point that we're missing out on all the opportunities that we could have already ripped for us to start mm -hmm. thinking about businesses right and I know this is hard because I do myself love technology and I love my phone, but I am, I'm carving like for a long time, I've been carving out daily 
um, a, a, about an hour to think and meditate and do it or pray, whatever it is, right? Just to be and to pay attention to things that like, you know, to let my senses calm down. And um, I use also journaling and things like that because I need to figure out, you know, all the jumble of ideas in my mind to let them flow in a different way and to have them put in a, in, in a paper with, a, you know, u- using a real pen <laughs> has been absolutely important for my ideas to flow and to also me trying to pick them apart and see what's important, right? So I suggest that, well, two things. One is take time um, and quiet calmly every day. Consider your thinking time, mini vacations. I know people are going to say, ah, you don't know my life. Well, you don't know my life either. I wake up every day at five. I work out every day. You know, yes, I'm alpha. What can I say? You know what I mean? I'm super alpha, but it's, it's how I am. And I, that are 24 hours, you, me and Beyonce have the same 24 hours a day. Mm-hmm. Look, the work she gets done or JLo. Look at the work those women get done. So then, you know, if they could get it done, I can get it done too, right? So um, I also suggest people to pay attention to margins. And uh, this is absolutely important because it, everything starts in the margins before it becomes mainstream. So what we have to look at right now in the margins is all the things that are crypto, even though right now it is kind of like mainstream, it was even two years ago it was not. Right. And uh, we have to look at this whole idea of what it is that technology is going to bring forward with the combination of real and uh, you know reality and virtual reality and augmented reality because there are going to be a lot of opportunities and people are going to say, but I'm not a technology person and I'm not a programmer. No, if you are using social media, this whole metaverse world is going to op- provide opportunities for people to grow their businesses, to collaborate with brands and with designers and things like that. So they, if anything, Tris just tried to get a little bit of uh, documentation, if you will, of what's going on in those spaces, what's going on in the spaces of NFTs, what's going on, because this is coming. And if you're an early adopter, you have a higher chance of capitalizing on it than if you coming like six years after right and so i think that that's all part of being creative is is uh, having sharpening your attention skills by being present you mentioned a couple of times the word mindfulness and i think that people have lost also their ability to be in the moment Mm -hmm. and when you try at the beginning when you were talking about um, this mindful moment I think that we are busy and we are always rushing and trying to fit in too much in our days that are already very full. And when that happens is that you lose every opportunity to be mindful. And with that, you lose every opportunity to be creative. You lose every opportunity to spot chances and opportunities and things like that. So with that, I think that if you can be mindful and if you are aware of what you're doing, you can bring yourself back to the present and say, okay, I'm gonna take the next five minutes, 10 minutes to close my eyes and to breathe and to be here. And, um, or I'm gonna do this every day on my lunch hour. And I'm gonna take, instead of one hour, I'm gonna take 50 minutes to eat and play on be on social media and then 10 minutes to close my eyes and think and sort of like, Think about this as a brain for your shower, a shower for your brain. That's what I meant. Yeah. A shower for your brain, you know, because a lot of people uh, forget that the brain needs also a little bit more of rest than what we are affording it. You know, we're giving it. We, we just can't live like this. Um, not we're not meant to live like this. Right. That's beautifully said. Absolutely perfect. And the idea that, you know, you should work an extra hour. No, you should do exactly what you just described for an hour. And that will get you so much farther. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm so inspired. So I'm Uh, sure people listening are, can you tell people how to find you, engage with you? I know I'm subscribing to your email. It's fantastic. I would highly recommend it. Thank you. I mean, everybody can find uh, me in the links to the newsletter and social media 
at mariabrito.com. That's Maria, B-R-I-T as in Tom, O, dot com. And uh, that's where you're going to find the free newsletter every Tuesday and uh, a lot of other resources for people who want to know what I do or they just are interested in this idea of becoming more creative in whatever it is that they do because that's my why. That's what I write that newsletter is because I want people to have the same blessing and opportunity that I've had by going after the things they love. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. I, um, I'm, I'm so inspired and I just you, uh, really You're, appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Your um, audience is very valuable to me as well. So I'm thankful for this. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to connecting in person soon. Yes, thank you. I would love that. And I'm going to ask the audience to think, you know, when I always do a tough love money tip at the end, and we didn't talk so much specifically about money, but of course, business is <laughs> all about money. But how can you get more creative in everything you do? And just to, get, to wake up in the morning and ask yourself that question, including money, you can be pretty creative in the in the realm of money as well as in the your professional life and, and your business. So just a thank you again. And uh, I hope everyone listening will take all of this in and really, you know, take some notes and, and think about how you can incorporate these fabulous ideas that Maria brought to us today into your life and business. So you will find us here on uh, streaming live from UBN Go on Monday nights at seven and then on all the podcast platforms right after that. And so uh, please subscribe, listen, and uh, we, we love your questions too. I'd love to hear from you, Michelle, two L's at limitfreelife.com. You can reach out anytime. With that, have a great week. We'll see you next time.